At this time, I would like to welcome to the stage Nathan Parker with a story about risk, revolution, and backyard metallurgy. Hello, everyone. Hello. Okay, here we go. Yeah, sure, we'll go with that. All right. So, the Great Leap Forward. Uh, when we talk about risk, especially in a country as individualistic as America, we almost always tend to talk about individuals and the ways that they've risked their health, wealth, or sanity to accomplish something grand and or absurd. Uh, this is not that conversation. This is, this is about risk on a nation population level. Uh, for those who aren't... By the way, show of hands, anyone here familiar with the Great Leap Forward? Does that phrase ring a bell? Okay, decent number. All right, so you, you, know, you know what to expect. You might need an extra drink. This is not a happy talk, but um, the, the slide, by the way, uh, is in, in particular reference to, uh, I don't know if anyone knows much about 20th century Chinese history. China had been the preeminent power in the world for basically ever, uh, and and kind of got really comfortable resting on their laurels, and then uh, suddenly industrialized Britain came along and humiliated them in a way that imperial England was really good at doing. Um, yeah, uh, look up the opium war. It's, uh, okay. So, we tend to think less about risks that happen on the scale of nations and populations. Uh, in this case, specifically, I'm talking about when a country that's been built on one type of economy wants to make a transition into a wholly other form of economy in as short a time as possible. Uh, given that our current economy, built entirely on burning cheap hydrocarbons for energy and exploiting a finite planet for infinite growth, uh, will need to undergo a similarly radical transition to a post-carbon economy around, I don't know, 30 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I think about this kind of thing a lot. Remember, doom is the new hope. Um, uh, you know, old and new hope. Uh, so the Great Leap Forward was one of Mao Zedong's grandest experiments and biggest risks in 33 years of ruling the People's Republic of China. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about Mao himself, but it helps to know he was born to a peasant farming family, left school at the age of 13. He was extremely suspicious of technology, intellectuals, and experts, and the bourgeois class that they were strongly associated with. Uh, he was a founding member of the Communist Party of China, helped found the Red Army, and ultimately became head of the Communist Party during the Long March. Uh, his distrust of science is important here, so please remember that as we go. Uh, so the Great Leap Forward was launched in January of 1958, and was born from Mao Zedong's impatience for industrial manufacturing growth. Uh, in, his, in his words, more, faster, better, cheaper. Uh, many of you have maybe have heard the phrase, good, fast, cheap, you can pick two. This is apparently not yet axiomatic in, in China. Um, uh, these, were, these plans were originally built on the Soviet model, uh, but Mao favored an ideological shift in economic policy that would continue industrialization, but also move towards agricultural collectivization. Uh, no more family farms, just these, these massive communes. Uh, within a fairly short period of time, the entire Chinese countryside, all of the farmable land in China was organized into, I think, about 20,000 farming communes, uh, which were huge. Uh, and these basically, if you, if you lived below the like, party official level, these communes were your entire existence and dictated life or death. Uh, any case, this, the focus on agriculture and peasants came from his own experience growing up in that way and also a deep suspicion of technology and the bourgeois. Uh, uh, these are some great propaganda posters of the, the glorious utopia that the Great Leap Forward was supposed to usher in. Uh, there'll be a lot throughout the thing. Uh, the Great Leap Forward was ultimately about transforming the Chinese economy into this industrial powerhouse to rival the great Western powers that had humiliated them in recent memory, such as the British during the Opium War, as the occupation of Hong Kong, etc. Uh, Mao himself said that his goal was to exceed the industrial capacity of the UK within 15 years. Uh, and this, this estimate was then revised down to five. Uh, at the time, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the UK was producing something like five, I had like 
well over 500% of the, the steel output uh, as China at that time. Um, uh, and, and beyond even this, it was going to become this shining example uh, to the world of a communist utopia. You know, if, if the Soviets were going to reach you know, the end stage communism where everything is great for everybody within 20 years, they were gonna do it in five. They were gonna show the world that they could do this. Uh, notably later, uh, Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge decided that they were gonna do it even faster than China. We know how well that worked out. Um, in short, he wanted to make China great again. <laughs> Too soon? It's ongoing. Uh, um, uh, this is, this is a, a passage from uh, a, phen a phenomenal book on this topic, if anyone's interested in following up on it, called Hungry Ghosts. Uh, to launch the Great Leap Forward, Mao whipped up a fever of expectation all over China that amounted to mass hysteria. Mao, the infallible, the great leader, the brilliant Marxist, the outstanding thinker and genius, promised that he would create a heaven on earth. Even in the 40s, the party had encouraged a cult of personality around Mao, but this reached new and sort of grotesque heights as he became this infallible semi-divine being. The nation's poets, writers, journalists, scientists, and the entire Communist Party joined him in proclaiming that utopia was at hand. Out of China, the land of famine, he would make China the land of abundance. The Chinese would have so much food they would not know what to do with it, and people would leave it a life of leisure, working only a few hours a day. Under his gifted leadership, China would enter the final stage of communism ahead of every other country on Earth. Uh, in short, there was going to be so much winning, everyone would be sick of it. Uh, Fantasies about the utopia that awaited them spread across the entire company, pro uh, country, sorry, promises. <laughs> um, promises of idle luxury for the poorest peasant and, uh, you know, they, prom they were promising people living in, t you know, Tibet that they would have skyscrapers to live in. People were like, what are those? I'm like, it's great, it'll be fine. Um, you know, as, as factories and mills springing up magically across the fertile countryside. There was, however, a bit of a catch. Uh, Mao had sort of a casual relationship with science. Uh, Mao, belie <laughs> Mao believed that modern science could transform the lives of millions of ignorant peasants sunk in the mire of centuries of feudal superstition, but that there was no time to convince them. There was, not, there was no time to educate them. They just had to be dragged kicking and screaming into the 20th century. Uh, he wasn't entirely, his definition of science, however, would not really have matched ours. Um, there's, a, there's a great quote, uh, Kang Shen, one of his loyal henchmen, uh, exemplified this uh, in a speech to teachers in Hunan, 1958. He said, what is science? Science is simply acting daringly. There's nothing mysterious about it. There's nothing special about making nuclear reactors, cyclotrons, or rockets. You shouldn't be frightened by these things. As long as you act daringly, you will be able to succeed every every time. Just act recklessly and it will be all right. I, I, I don't know. Um, you be the judge. Uh, so all over the country, schools, universities, research institutes were springing up as the real scientists were sent to prison or gulags, uh, and that these institutes untrained peasants were carrying out scientific research uh, and announcing miracles on a you know, nearly weekly basis. Um, the, the miracles Mao was most concerned with, though, were, grain, or were having uh, ways to increase grain and steel production. Uh, steel production is mainly what I'm going to focus on, just because this is too big a topic for 10 minutes. So, in 1959, all across the country, people began setting up smelter, uh, homemade smelters and backyard furnaces uh, to create high-quality steel. Uh, to meet these wildly optimistic quotas, people were handing in bicycles, railings, iron bedsteads, doorknobs, pots and pans and cooking grates. Uh, to fire the furnaces, the fields and hills were stripped bare of trees, people broke down doors, uh, furniture, etc. cetera. Um, there's another picture. This is, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to melt metal, but... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how'd it go? Uh, did, did they achieve the grand utopia that they'd been promised? Not so much. Um, yeah, it gets a little grim, sorry. Uh, so, 
the same, the, you know, again, I, did, I didn't talk about the grain production, I talked about the steel production. The two are closely inter interlinked, and the similar attitude was brought to both. Um, the, the famine uh, in China during that period of time wiped out basically the combined death toll of all sides in World War II. Or put another way, uh, imagine the entire population of Australia and Canada starved to death in three years. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a dark time, and this was 1960. This is not that long ago. Uh, despite the story, of the, despite the sort of this cataclysm uh, being generally suppressed by the Chinese government, some accounts survived. Uh, again, Hungry Ghosts, Mao's Secret Famine, if you're, if you're curious to read more. Uh, I'm just going to give one scene here, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, so in 1959, there was a drought in Hanan Province, Xinjiang Prefecture. The provincial party secretary lowered the grain quota to reflect this. Uh, but the local leadership, with the aforementioned relationship to science, decided nature was not going to stand in their way. They were like, no, we will, have this, we will produce the same amount of grain, drought be damned. Uh, and county officials, who were not, of course, actually collecting the grain, strove to outdo each other in reporting good results. Uh, after the summer, the first secretary of Xinjiang province, Lu Xianwen, declared that despite the drought, the harvest was 8.6 billion pounds, which was double the actual figure harvested. Grain levies at this point by the government were almost 90% of total harvest. When you're taking 90% of twice of what you've actually harvested, you end up with people who have given 100% of, of the grain that they need to live, and then there's this brutal crackdown on them for hoarding grain, which didn't go very well. Uh, so, end result of this. Uh, in an effort to save face, throughout all of this, China actually remained a substantial net exporter of grain. Um, uh, even Japan that came to them and sort of like, you know, I, we don't have to tell anyone, we'll just send you grain, it's okay. You could like, and they're like, no, 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 we're fine. Um, uh, but finally in 1961, sort of the spell was broken and uh, Mao was openly criticized for the first time since he came to rule. His, his divinity was, was shattered and he was kind of put out to pasture for a little while. He was allowed to remain chairman but was no longer really involved in politics directly for some years. Uh, before he made his comeback with the Cultural Revolution, which is a whole other story. Uh, uh, for now, if there's any takeaway from this tale, it's this. Uh, when it comes to mobilizing people in huge numbers to take huge risks, a compelling story will usually beat cold facts, and scientists really need to get better at telling a compelling story. So to all you experts in the room, may you never shut up. <laughs> Oh man, for...